for me, it's so easy. It's just so easy. So if we could put aside the conflicts, would we all be able to agree that we should eat real food and not processed food? Surely that is a starting point that we could all agree on. And it's actually where carnivores and vegans should be on the same plate. So please, guys, can we agree? We know horribly conflicted in the US with the dietitians in bed with half of the fake food companies in the world. It's the same in the UK. It's absolutely the same in Australia, although they're trying to clean it up a bit. So that is getting in the way of what should be just such an easy first principle eat real food this is episode number 123 of pursuing health featuring zoe harkal welcome to pursuing health i'm julie fouché family medicine resident and former crossfit games athlete here i bring to you information and inspiration from experts and everyday individuals for how to use lifestyle to maximize health thank you so much for joining me now let's get started with this week's episode Well, hello there, everybody, and welcome back to Pursuing Health. I'm very excited to share a conversation with you in this episode that I had with Dr. Zoe Harcombe. Zoe is a widely known researcher, author, blogger, and speaker in the fields of nutrition and health, and she has particular interests and area of expertise in public health dietary guidelines, which we talk about a lot in this conversation, especially when it comes to dietary fat, nutrition, and obesity. A little bit of background about Zoe's education. She earned her bachelor's and master's in economics and mathematics from Cambridge University, and she then went on to do her PhD in public health nutrition at the University of the West of Scotland. Now, as I've come to learn in getting to know Zoe, she's very well known and well sought out for her ability to dissect nutritional research studies. Um, Frequently, other physicians and scientists are contacting her to dissect and analyze new research studies and get her opinion on them. Zoe and I had the opportunity to meet this past summer at the 2019 CrossFit Health Conference. We recorded this conversation just a couple days before she gave one of the most compelling talks of the entire conference. If you haven't heard it yet, be sure to check it out. I've linked up to it in the show notes at juliefouché.com forward slash podcast. Um, I would highly suggest going to check that out after you listen to this episode. Here we talk about everything from her background and where her interest in nutrition started from, to her PhD thesis work, the state of nutrition research, the addictive nature of carbohydrates, why she changed from a vegetarian to a meat eater, and how she thinks that meat consumption is important for our environment. So lots of hot topics, lots of great discussion, lots of research in this episode. I do have to give you a warning. This conversation started out with a bang, and we jumped right into the thick of the research as Zoe lists off a number of different studies that she referenced and dissected in her PhD thesis work toward the beginning of the podcast. So don't be overwhelmed or intimidated by this. If you're listening, we quickly settle into um, a more slow paced conversation without quite as much research that's so overwhelming. Um, and so stick with us towards the end of the conversation is really where some of the best gems come out as well. So stick with it to the end. Now, before we get started, this is a reminder that although I am now officially a doctor, this podcast is meant to share the experiences of individuals and does not provide medical advice. And with that, we'll get started with episode 123 of Pursuing Health featuring Zoe Harcombe. Welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm very excited to be here with Dr. Zoe Harcombe today, who traveled all the way from Wales that I just learned about last evening (laughs) (laughs) to be here in Madison, Wisconsin for the CrossFit Health Conference. I'm looking forward to hearing you speaking there, but thanks for sitting down with me. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome. And I want to get into all of the nitty gritty of nutrition research and dietary guidelines, but I thought first, maybe we could just start off with a little bit of background about yourself, um, what things you were into growing up, and then how did you gain such an interest in nutrition? Okay. Um, Fairly ordinary childhood. Um, My brother then developed type 1 diabetes when he was 15 and I was 13, and it had a huge impact on the household. And the advice wasn't as bad then as it is now. So I remember the family being called into the hospital and given uh, explanations about the fact that he may go into a hypo and Mm -hmm. what we should do or he may go into a hyper Mm -hmm. episode and what should we do so from a very young age I was quite aware Mm -hmm. of the impact of glucose and insulin on particularly my big beloved brother Mm -hmm. and that really hit home Um, then as most teenage girls I guess didn't have a terribly great relationship with food Mm -hmm. Um, got up to Cambridge University not having a great relationship with food and became 
became women's officer for my college uh, before becoming the college president. Mm -hmm. And when I was the women's officer, we were called, all the women's officers from the various colleges were called up to the central university bit to be given some training on women's issues. So it was the era of rape alarms and Mm -hmm. women needing to be safe walking around at Mm -hmm. night and so on. But one of the big initiatives that was coming out from the university was on eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at some of the literature and thinking, crikey, this is talking to me, but I'm sure it's not going to talk to anyone else in my university, all these super bright, super beautiful women that I felt really (laughs) sort of intimidated by. And I was only the second year intake at my College of Women. So the college was founded in 1352. Mm -hmm. And it took until about 600 years later or something for them to actually realize that women should be allowed in. So at the time I was there, there were only about 220 people in the college and only about 20 of those were female. So I took this literature back and I said to a few of the other women, hey, if anyone's interested, thinking nobody would be. Every single woman came to talk to me. Wow. And I just thought, this is so classic. This is the the high achiever, Mm -hmm. um, the driven, the hardworking female Mm -hmm. who, because I've come to realize... Uh, eating disorders are actually not really about food they're about self-esteem and they're about control Mm -hmm. and it was just then so typical to see driven high achieving females being quite concerned about uh, Mm -hmm. image and self-perception other people's perception and also this need to control Mm -hmm. so that that was my first kind of interest and I then started looking into why I I guess it became the title of my first book actually in 2004 why do you overeat when all you want is to be slim Mm -hmm. and I I could not understand this is now back in the late 1980s why Mm -hmm. my peer group were eating stuff that they didn't want to be eating they wanted to be slim but they were just finding themselves addicted to food Mm -hmm. so then I became really interested in the whole food addiction thing I left Cambridge I got a proper job as my mum would call it Mm -hmm. Um, had a great career ended up as a uh, global vice president for human resources at blue chip organizations I had great career traveled loads Mm -hmm. Uh, managed uh, fabulous, fabulous teams of people looking after human resources across organizations. I also worked in manufacturing and finance and sales and uh, many, many different fields, but ended up in HR. Um, But I I always knew that there was a book that I wanted to write. And then finally in 2004, wrote Why Do You Overeat When All You Want Is To Be Slim? Mm -hmm. And then when the world kind of almost fell apart in 2008, as many executives did, got the mm-hmm. opportunity to leave the corporate world and chatted with my husband and just said, right, we've got to got to give this a go. We're absolutely fascinated by diet and health, nutrition, mm-hmm. why people are not doing what they know they should be doing, why our governments are still not telling us the right things that they should be telling us. Mm-hmm. So let's just see if we can make a living out of this. It's not going to be the living that we made before, but if we can put food on the table and cat food in the bowl and dog food as we had yeah. then, then um, then we'll be okay. And here we are 10 years on. We started doing our working together in, in 2008, the back end of. Wow. And here we are just over 10 years later. That's amazing. Doing okay. And so you both jumped off at the same time where you both went in on this or or were you still working at, at your other job for some um, period so of time? I, I I jumped completely okay. so I, I took the opportunity um, to take um, to take the package basically mm-hmm. to, to leave the organization Andy my husband had been working running a internet company mm-hmm. at the time and that then fitted really well because a lot of what we do is on the internet mm-hmm. so instead of working for other organizations he kind of tailored down so he'd work more and more for what we were doing and less and less for other people and then when we got to the point that it was Mm self-sufficient he could then stop working mostly for other people unless somebody really needs a favor Mm -hmm. we'll we'll always help out Mm -hmm. but then he does all of our publishing online and um, looks after the clubs and just does everything all Mm -hmm. I do is read write and talk and he does everything else that's amazing wow so this whole time while you're working like you said a proper job you still have this really strong interest in nutrition and you're writing books. I mean, most people when they're working in a busy job are not writing books on the side. So what, what was it that, that inspired you to say, I want to put a book out there, um, versus maybe doing something else with your passion for nutrition? Yeah. The, um, the, the first book, I guess, you, you just want to share messages. People mm-hmm. don't write books to make money. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that is such a, a fallacy in this world. You'll get attacks on Twitter saying, oh, you just want to sell books and make money. It's like, do you have any idea? <laughs> so I sort of explained to them the economics of publishing, and I don't know what it's like in the US. It's, it's probably not dissimilar because mm-hmm. Amazon is global. Mm-hmm. But the situation is if you've got a 10 buck book or 10 pound book in the mm-hmm. UK, then Amazon are looking to have a 65% margin on that. So they're looking for six bucks 50. Mm-hmm. So then you've got three bucks 50 left 
which is to cover the author, the publisher, the typesetter, the cover designer, the proofreader, the actual physical publication of the book, mm -hmm. the distribution, any storage, anybody else in the channels. So you're then scrapping over those uh, sort of three and a half bucks that are left. Mm -hmm. So an author will typically get um, seven to ten percent, if they're lucky, of of the price that it's sold for. So because Amazon have got this huge margin, mm -hmm. they'll want to sell a ten buck book for five ninety nine, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so then the author might be looking at any anywhere up to fifty sixty cents wow. from that particular book. And then you learn that the average book actually only sells about two thousand copies. Really? Yeah, the average books. So when you stack them all yeah. up, and you've got J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter sure. and all this mummy porn stuff or whatever's <laughs> going on at the moment millions yeah. of sales and then you've got somebody writing a technical book down at the other end that may only sell 500 copies yeah. a lot of publishers if you're getting anywhere near 10,000 copies being sold they yeah. actually think you're a real you're doing really well wow. um, there'll be a couple of people who've, mm -hmm. who've done okay out of a book deal in this alternative world people writing in the real food sure. natural health arena but most people are just doing something to get the message out there mm -hmm. and so you went on to publish several books and you're publishing on your website and getting that information out there and then at what point did you decide hey I want to go back and study this and get my PhD and why did you decide to do that no that's a good question actually um, I, I've had so many questions from people saying where can I study to really learn about nutrition and that mm -hmm. was the that was the question I was asking myself so when I'd left the corporate world you suddenly realize that a qualification isn't important because it's actually the people without the qualifications who are challenging the status quo mm -hmm. if you're trained in the status quo it's much more difficult you just can't see the wood for the trees you can't see that what you were trained was completely wrong so right. I wasn't thinking oh I've got to get a qualification but I was really interested in studying something in nutrition mm -hmm. at a, a good level so you do look around and you say is there any single course out there mm -hmm. that would actually teach me something good about nutrition and you realize that there are some that are better than others but there just isn't mm -hmm. and then when you start studying it for yourself so I will often say when you research nutrition and I don't mean being taught nutrition but genuinely researching nutrition for yourself and you start realizing the kind of things that I weave into presentations so you suddenly realize that saturated fat is is, is in just everything mm -hmm. saturated fat is in blueberries <laughs> okay only in a trace amount but mm -hmm. so why are they attacking saturated fat why would nature put it in every single damn food on the planet mm -hmm. if it really were so bad for us and then you start realizing other things about food so why are they talking about omega-3 fats in flaxseed when they're not in the form that the body wants so you mm -hmm. just realize down to the calorie theory or you know to lose one pound of fat you need a def deficit of three and a half thousand calories which is the biggest bit of nonsense lie anyone's ever told you just realize that everything is wrong five a day mm -hmm. complete fairy story everything is wrong so you just want to study at a level that will help you to understand what is right mm -hmm. um, and then it, it seemed right to do there's not even a master's or something that's of any value so I thought okay I want to do something at the PhD level mm -hmm. as that's kind of the level that I feel I should be studying at mm -hmm. and then I did look at doing a practical experiment in the lab I was going to do something called the breakfast experiment okay. and I get so annoyed when you're watching TV programs and they say oh we gave this person a high fat breakfast and then look at their arteries clogging up right. and the high fat breakfast turned out to be hash browns and baked beans and mm. McMuffins you know they've taken them to McDonald's and right. had a, a milkshake and oh there was a bit of bacon <laughs> but th they call that the high fat diet so I said okay I want to I want to do a crossover trial so we maybe only need a dozen people and we get them to have a 400 calorie breakfast of pure carbohydrate and there's only one pure carbohydrate mm -hmm. that's sucrose so mm -hmm. poor Sarge you're going to have 400 calories of sugar mm -hmm. then you have 400 calories of pure fat that could be olive oil coconut oil whatever mm -hmm. 400 calories of pure protein there's no pure protein on the planet but white fish or skinless chicken breast gets close mm -hmm. and then look at what genuinely happens with triglycerides which is what they're spotting in the blood or the insulin response or the glucose response and of course your prediction before going in is that fat is going to have no glucose or insulin response sugar is obviously going to have an insulin response um, and a glucose response and protein we we know has an insulin response but not a glucose response mm -hmm. but what would be really interesting is then looking at things like the triglycerides and the stuff that they're measuring in those documentaries when they are giving the wrong breakfast mm -hmm. but for various reasons that didn't happen partly ethics you're um, giving these people this god awful <laughs> diet even <laughs> if it's just one morning yeah. uh, and I'm not even sure you could eat 400 calories worth of skinless disgusting. chicken breast <laughs> um, so we didn't end up doing that and I'd been long 
absolutely fascinated by the seven country study mm-hmm. and I'd been studying it at kind of PhD level without doing that right. so it just seemed natural I remember talking to the supervisor in the quite early days I had mm-hmm. a brilliant supervisor in Cardiff a retired professor mm-hmm. and we used to chew the fat over a cup of coffee and I don't exactly know when the idea came up but it was to look at the dietary fat guidelines because of course Keyes started off thinking that total fat was a problem in his six countries graph Mm -hmm. that's not the seven country study very different and then by the time he came to do the seven country study he said you know what I don't think it is total fat he found nothing against total fat I think it's saturated fat and then you start thinking well why did they change those guidelines then in Mm -hmm. 1977 embedded in the dietary guidelines for americans in 1980 why would you do that if there just wasn't any evidence Mm -hmm. so i then wanted to look at what was the evidence at the time which i guess was the really novel bit of the phd not Mm -hmm. just now because there are other people looking at it now but at the time they set those guidelines should they have set them Mm -hmm. and then you go to the evidence pyramid and the best evidence that you can find in this world is believed to be the meta-analysis and systematic review of randomized controlled trials so Mm -hmm. start there then for completeness you can look at the meta-analysis and systematic review of the epidemiological studies of which Mm -hmm. the seven countries was one so it was it was then looking beyond the seven country study to say okay what were the peer studies Mm -hmm. of the seven country study and going in i didn't i was just really really super familiar with the seven country study i've been obsessed with it Um, i didn't know about the stuff that was going on in honolulu and puerto rico and the Mm -hmm. london bank and bus study and then the rct T trials are much better known, the rose corn oil and olive oil, um, the MRC study, the soybean study, Lerin, Oslo, the diet heart study, Sydney, Woodhill, their study. And and you suddenly realise there's there's six RCTs that you need to look at and there are actually then six epidemiological studies that you need to look at as well. So the really novel bit was going back at the time. And I remember when I uh, turned up at a conference in South Africa in 2015, which Karen mm-hmm. Thompson had organised. We didn't know at the time that Prof Noakes had just been charged with all this ludicrous stuff over mm-hmm. a tweet. She knew. So she wanted to arrange the conference to say, hey, Prof, you're not on your own. There's a lot of people around the world who are saying similar things, believe similar things to, mm-hmm. to, to make him realise. He, he felt quite lonely, but mm-hmm. he, he wasn't alone. And I I remember turning up at the conference and Prof was just like one of my gods. So I mean, when he sort of turned around, he said, hey, great paper, because it had just come out oh, the, the week wow. before the conference. And he said, um, the, the research question is everything. And he said to ask the research question, was the evidence there at the time? He said, I love that. I just love that. And I'm like, oh, my God, I can just go That's home amazing. now. I was like, just so happy. That's amazing. Um, but I, I think it was just a, a great conversation that... Mm-hmm me and and uh professor bruce davies were having in in cardiff at the time to say um okay let's go back and look at it at the time Mm -hmm. and then the second part of the phd was to bring it up to date and say okay so that was then and i was really surprised Mm -hmm. that there was no evidence i really thought there would be evidence but something yeah yeah, but maybe it wasn't that robust Mm -hmm. that that would have been my guess going in Mm -hmm. Um, but you do try to go into research genuinely Mm open-minded Um, not having any preconceived ideas. So then you bring it up to date and look at all the evidence that's available now. And then in the final wrap-up chapter of the PhD, it's very important to put your own work in the context of others. And that was really interesting as well, because I'm by no means alone in having looked over recent years Mm -hmm. at meta-analyses and systematic reviews. So you've got the Siri Torino study from 2010. You've got Schwingshackel and Hoffman, I think that was 2014. Chowdhury, 2014. You've got the Hooper. Mm -hmm. Cochrane Reviews 2011-2015 there's a lot of other research that's out there and in uh, the wrap up part of my PhD which was then published almost as it was from the PhD in the British Journal of Sports Medicine as the wrap up paper and if you google something like dietary guidelines have no evidence Mm -hmm. base my name and BGSM this open paper will come up And in the open paper, I then listed the 40 findings from all these teams of researchers, just included two of my findings, Mm -hmm. not the eight that I could have done, um, and put it in the context of all those others. And what was utterly amazing was just no finding, no finding, no finding, no finding. So Mm -hmm. out of 40 findings, 37 of them were not statistically significant. So people were reporting no association, not even an association between total fat or saturated fat or swapping out saturated fat and swapping in polyunsaturated fat Mm -hmm. just repeatedly no findings no findings no findings 
And then you look at that and say, why is that not the headline? Mm -hmm. That there just is no evidence. So then you look at the three findings that end up being still there. You've got Chowdhury, who found against trans fats. No argument from anyone there at all. Trans fats are hideous. Um, so you're down to two findings, mm -hmm. which is basically just the two Hooper reviews. And again, in Hooper, if you actually listed out in the abstract all their non-findings, for me, that's far more powerful than the tiny one that they did find. Mm -hmm. So Hooper should have said, we found nothing for mortality or cardiovascular disease mortality or coronary heart disease mortality or strokes or myocardial infarctions or non-fatal myocardial. You just found nothing for any of that. Oh, but we found this one thing for CVD events if you swap out saturated fat and swap in polyunsaturated fat. Mm. And then Dr. Trudy Deacon in the UK, I always credit her for this, you should always credit where somebody else finds something mm -hmm. and you didn't. She'd gone through the whole 100 and whatever, 80 page Cochrane report and said, hey, did you spot that when they did the sensitivity test, not just for the studies that intended to swap out saturated fat and swap in poly, but those that actually did, the significance fell away. Mm. And that was their own sensitivity test. So again, the abstract in Hooper, and this is a Cochrane study, mm -hmm. the abstract should have been, we didn't find anything in all of these cases. So don't even worry about all of this stuff. Oh, by the way, we did find something for CVD uh, events when you can swap out saturated fat. But then when we sensitivity tested it for the studies that actually managed to do that, that finding fell away as well. So our conclusion is there is no issue with saturated fat, full stop. That should have been the abstract of the two Hooper reviews. And Cochrane is supposed to be unbiased, but of course it wasn't. They didn't mention all the non-findings. They didn't mention the sensitivity test. Mm -hmm. So you've got most public health advisors worldwide now still running around saying you need to swap out saturated fat and swap in polyunsaturated fat because of CVD events. Mm -hmm. So is that, so if you, you know, through all of your research, even looking at the research studies at the time, um, knowing that these dietary fat guidelines were introduced, why do you think they were introduced? And what, or what have you found out about why they were introduced if there was really no evidence for it? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I think Senator McGovern has mm -hmm. to take a lot of the rap for it. And I think Ansel Keys mm -hmm. needs to take a lot of the rap for it. Now, a lot of people are very critical in our world of Ansel Keys. And you can't just entirely criticize the, the guy. He was very, very good mm -hmm. at a lot of what he did. And his early work, he did the Minnesota starvation experiment towards the end of the Second World War, taught us so much about the impact of calorie deficit diets on human beings. A fabulous piece of work there. We should really learn from that mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Never put anyone on a calorie control diet simply because of that study. Mm -hmm. So you can't just write him off as a quack or a, a bad scientist or whatever. I, I don't like it when people do that. Mm -hmm. But then you have to look at where he wasn't entirely straightforward mm -hmm. with what he was finding. Um, his conclusions weren't weren't strident by any means. So a lot is credited to him as, oh, he was anti-fat and mm -hmm. anti-saturated fat. If you go and read the 20 volumes of the Seven Country Study for yourself, and then you look at the summary, volume 20, look at the summary and it will say when we got to the end of the seven country study um, his findings were that saturated fat in some way is related to heart disease cholesterol is in some way related to heart disease saturated fat is some way related to cholesterol so he thought those three things were related in some way but didn't go much more stridently than mm -hmm. that he wasn't waving papers around mm -hmm. in 1970 saying oh i found the definitive yeah. attack on saturated fat we're all going to die so i think a lot of his research was was taken as being much more strident than it actually mm -hmm. was and then of course along comes senator George McGovern, he had originally been tasked at looking at America eating enough because there were areas of poverty where nutritional deficiency was mm -hmm. thought to be the issue. Crikey, wind forward 50 years. <laughs> Who'd have thought we've got the, uh, the opposite problem? <laughs> exactly, yeah, the obesity that we're now trying to get a handle on. And that was his original brief, but mm -hmm. politicians, they quite often go over their brief, don't they? they? They enjoy the attention and the power that we've given to them. So he then started looking at what he thought would just be a generally healthy diet for Americans. And much is made, and I think this is significant, of the fact that he'd been on a Pritikin boot camp mm. just before he was meeting with his committee to look at the dietary guidelines. And if you've been on a low-fat, practically plant food, vegan yeah 
boot camp and you're going to feel great because mm-hmm. anyone who moves to a real food diet moving away from the standard American diet which is very heavily mm-hmm. processed is going to feel great go vegan or go carnivore mm-hmm. for a couple of weeks if you're on the standard American diet it doesn't matter which one you do you're going to feel good oh, yeah. over the next couple of weeks so he's of course come in to these meetings with his own bias and then he's got vegetarians around him, Nick Motton and other people working on the dietary guidelines. There's a very strong plant-based bias around him mm-hmm. and people were trying to plead with him. And there this famous video, Tom Norton used it in his Fathead movie where Dr. Robert Olson is, is pleading with him and saying, you can't l- unleash this experiment on the American people. <laughs> we just don't have the evidence. We don't know right. what the outcome is going to be. And McGovern famously replies and said, hey, you scientists, you've got all the time in the world. I'm a politician. I don't have that luxury. Mm-hmm. I need to do something. And they really didn't believe, again, when you read the outputs that came from those dietary guidelines committee which I needed to every single page Mm -hmm. for my PhD and there were some fabulous passages where Nick Motton was writing and saying or or Mark Hegstead the two people who were heavily involved in this and saying uh, people say there will be consequences we we can't see what any consequences could be I mean what could possibly be the consequences of moving people to more whole grains more fruit more vegetables more fiber less meat what could possibly go wrong they really <laughs> couldn't see question. they just couldn't see it yeah um so now you've obviously spent a ton of time looking at dietary guidelines looking at nutrition research and for the majority of the population this is still incredibly confusing you know there's tons of noise out there even for someone who like myself who's gone through medical training one we don't really get much training at all in nutrition and then Two, the things that we're exposed to are completely conflicting. So you'll hear some teachers talking about the value of a vegan diet for health and swear by it. And then you hear others with a more of a Mediterranean style diet. And it's, it's difficult even for physicians to sort through, but let alone the lay public who Mm -hmm. are hearing all of these headlines about the next best diet. So as you look at the research as a whole, what do you know about or what is the research telling us about what is the best diet for us to be following for our health? Okay, yeah. I get this question a lot, actually. I've had this question on radio interviews where uh, radio producers will say, oh, I had someone in last week who said coffee's bad for me and now someone this week. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I, I do get this. For me, it's so easy. Mm-hmm. It's just so easy. So if we could put aside the conflicts, would we all be able to agree that we should eat real food and not processed food? Surely that is a starting point that we could all agree on. And it's actually where carnivores and vegans should be on the same plate. So Mm -hmm. please guys, can we agree? We know horribly conflicted in the US with the dietitians in Mm -hmm. bed with half of the fake food companies in the world. It's the same in the UK. It's absolutely the same in Australia, although they're trying to clean it up a bit. So that is getting in the way of what should be just such an easy first principle eat real food Mm -hmm. and then you've got some idiots who'll say what's real food you know is anything real well you can teach a five-year-old what real food is so I say things like oranges grow on trees cartons of orange juice don't right cows graze in the field meat sticks don't or whatever you might find in a package in the supermarket right. fish swim in the sea fish sticks don't or fish fingers so you, you can teach it to a child if it's in the natural environment in the form mm-hmm. in which you would most directly find it then it's a natural food so that should be step one and then my second principle is then choose that real food for the nutrients it provides mm. So then you go back to what do we actually need as human beings? So in terms of nutrition, we need essential fats, omega-3 and omega-6, and we need them in the right form. And that's not the form that they come in in flaxseed. It's the form that they come in in animals, Mm. particularly oily fish, omega-3s. We need complete protein. Where do you find complete protein? In animal foods. Mm -hmm. We need 13 vitamins. There's a little bit more debate on how many minerals, but it's going to be somewhere around 16. Mm -hmm. You can debate just exactly what is essential and what isn't. But the classics of calcium and phosphorus and iron and zinc and copper, magnesium, those we do need to get through our diet. So they're all very, very important. And when you look at where you find those nutrients and where you find them in the form that the body needs them. And I was a vegetarian for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to find this out. This was the last thing. This was against what you had been conditioned to do. This was against my confirmation bias. My confirmation bias going into any study of nutrition. I was vegetarian when I wrote my first three books. My confirmation bias would have been 
we don't need to eat animals, particularly meat and fish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the evidence just does not support that. So the body wants vitamin A in the form of retinol, which comes in animal foods. Carotene comes in plant foods. B12, of course, is only found in animal foods. You'll get vegans trying to claim that it comes from algae or seaweed or whatever. Good, good luck with that <laughs> one. That's not going to go down well. Um, vitamin D, you've got D3, which is the animal form. D2, the plant form. Guess what the body wants? K2, which you can get in fermented food, but you get it more naturally in animal foods. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got K1 from plant foods. And just every time you're getting the evidence saying the body needs to consume animals, whether you like it or not, that's where we find our nutrients. And that then should drive what we eat. Mm -hmm. So you look at the foods that have the greatest density of the essential fats, the complete proteins, the vitamins and the minerals, and it drives you towards meat. And particularly red meat and offal, not white meat. Chicken is fairly pointless. Um, don't waste your time on chicken. You need to be eating red meat and offal. Fish, ditto, oily fish. White fish is fairly useless nutritionally. So it's got tons of protein, probably more than you need. Um, dairy is great. Um, you get calcium and the bone nutrients, but you get those in oily fish as well. So if you're not good with dairy mm -hmm. and it's, it's very ethnic dairy. So you've got a lot of Asian people and black ethnicity people who are not good with dairy, mm -hmm. whereas white Northern Europeans tend to be very fine with dairy. It's rare to find intolerance. So it's within what then works for you as an individual right. and because of your genetic makeup and eggs are pretty universally tolerated by most people and are very nutritious nutritious and then some green things not essential because mm -hmm. there's no essential carbohydrate so you don't need to eat a plant um, as the carnivores are discovering you, you just don't you can get vitamin c in liver you can get get it from the thymus gland or whatever so there's no essential plant but i happen to think they're quite nice mm -hmm. and they I like my vegetables yeah i love i love my vegetable i love my salad i don't ever want to limit salads or vegetables mm -hmm. I love the freshness, I love the crunch, and they do bring things to the party. Mm -hmm. So they are rich in vitamin C, yellow peppers particularly. They are, particularly if you don't cook them, if you're having salad rather than cooked vegetables, you do get some iron, mm -hmm. uh, you do get some, some other nutrients that are worthwhile. Just incomparable compared to sardines or liver mm -hmm. or the really, really nutritious foods. Um, what other things then come in? Berries are nice. They're not mm -hmm. bringing much to the party, much more than vitamin C, but they're a great addition to a healthy diet, mm -hmm. particularly if you're enjoying them with natural yogurt um, or cream, um, mm -hmm. if you're very high fat, low carb. Um, nuts and seeds, I find, are an interesting food, mm -hmm. actually, because the other interesting thing when you study nutrition as opposed to being taught it, and mm -hmm. I'm just a mathematical nerd, so you start spotting patterns, yeah. and you spot, Real food actually comes in either carb protein form or fat protein form. And nature just doesn't mix them up very often. Mm -hmm. So your carb proteins are the things that vegans would eat. So they're the grains, things that come from the trees and the ground. Grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes. Mm -hmm. And then the fat proteins are the things that vegans wouldn't eat. So that's your meat, fish, eggs and dairy. Mm -hmm. But then in the middle, you've got a couple of really rare foods that have got fat protein and carbohydrate in pretty good measure. And they're nuts and seeds um, and avocados mm -hmm. probably count as a nut within that group as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really interesting because they're the, the foods that I think human beings can find most Moorish. Um, I don't know if that translates. I did an American podcast once. And they're like, what's uh, that? that? So yeah. th th that, you, that you want more of. Uh, so yes. you start eating nuts <laughs> and they're Moorish. You yes, want more you nuts. You could eat the whole jar. <laughs> exactly. And you don't get that when you actually, if, if you eat either carb proteins at the same time. So in, in my diet books, mm -hmm. I did write a couple of classic diet mm -hmm. books in 2007. I think they were updated in 2012 or something. Mm -hmm. The Harkham diet books they became known as. And I'm saying to people, have carb proteins or have fat proteins at your meal, but don't mix them. Mm -hmm. Because it's when you start mixing that you have this, it's almost like the limit of what you can eat is taken away. Mm. So if you have just cheese on its own, you've got a limit, particularly if you've just had steak and vegetables for the first course. If you have cheese with biscuits or cheese with bread, you have no limit. If you have so bread true. with butter, you have mm -hmm. no limit. But you wouldn't just sit down and eat the whole pack of right. butter. Exactly. Yeah. That's why ice cream is so delicious, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> but then you've got it there because what is the USP of fake food? They have put the fat mm -hmm. carb combo together. Right. It doesn't matter how much protein comes with fake food. It's the fat carb combo 
that human beings find utterly irresistible and it is at the heart of every fake food that you find. So even if you've got the McDonald's burger, which is the, the fat protein, comes with the bun, which is the carbohydrate coming mm-hmm. with it, or the hot dog with the roll that comes with the hot dog, as you say, the ice cream, cookies, mm-hmm. muffins, confectionery. It's that fat carb combo that we have no limit for. So you can eat 3,000 calories of ice cream mm-hmm. gateau. You just can't eat 3,000 calories of liver pate and broccoli. You just (laughs) can't do it. Or salmon and green beans. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. Right. You'll get full. Um, So take us through, you said you were vegetarian for 20 years. At what point did you personally decide to start changing your diet and introducing animal products? And what, I know a lot of people, you know, become vegetarian for ethical reasons about animal treatment and things like that. Was that part of your decision in the first place? And how did you kind of reconcile that as you made changes? Yeah, no, that's really difficult. Actually, it it was entirely about the animals. Mm -hmm. When I guess, no, that's probably not fair. So because I had eaten not a great relationship with food when Mm -hmm. I was up at university, all my peers, it. I think there is an element of, oh, look, I could cut out two entire food groups and then I'm going to be super slim because I'm not eating meat and fish or whatever. You don't realize that they're actually the worst two food groups (laughs) that you should cut out. You should be cutting out the grains, number Mm -hmm. one. Um, And then, I don't know, maybe legumes or something. And then you you might do well. So there was a little bit of that going on. But the main thing for me would be the animals. Mm -hmm. Um, And I still, to this day, absolutely hate the thought of eating animals. I do not enjoy eating me I eat it because I know that it's good for me Mm -hmm. and ironically because of all this stuff that's going on at the moment with the planet or whatever I eat it because I know it's the only food in the food chain that is giving back to topsoil without which we can't grow food on the planet Mm -hmm. Um, so so it's it's because my head now is actually overruling my heart saying for your own health and for the planet's health because we cannot just keep raping fields with vegan food soybeans Mm -hmm. and all the rest of it you need to be eating ruminants Mm -hmm. which is beef lamb goats in sheep goats in some parts of the world um, but you need to be eating those foods so when I was I guess first enlightened to the fact that I should be moving away for this I was actually at a Western Price conference in London in 2010 and I heard Sally Fallon Morell speak and that was the first time that I'd actually heard about the nutrients coming in different forms because mm-hmm. nobody talks about this because it's inconvenient to be pointing out to people that actually vitamin A, you need the animal form and not the plant form. They, they talk as if vitamin A is vitamin A. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. And mm-hmm. that's just not true. We need to be much more honest with people. And then quite soon after Sally spoke, Barry Grove spoke and Barry did a presentation on, um, I think it was called Homo Carnivorous. So man mm-hmm. as a carnivore mm-hmm. animal and how we've evolved to eat and the implications of not eating in this way. Um, And I just remember texting my hubby under the table at the conference saying, I'm going to be coming back, not a vegetarian. Uh. He's like, what? (laughs) Was he a vegetarian? No, my goodness, no. So he was pretty excited. (laughs) No, and he's the chef in our household, so he was thrilled because for the 10 years that we've been together up until that point, he'd been making two meals every evening. Occasionally he'd join me on the veggie meal, but he just wouldn't feel satiated. He'd just get to bed and he'd be waking up at two o'clock in the morning hungry. He's like, Mm -hmm. you know, are you hungry all the time? He's like, yeah, but I mean, is that not how the world <laughs> world is like you no know, you don't have to be hungry all the time um so that conference was the real turning point okay. um, and then I picked a date that I knew I'd remember so I picked Good Friday okay. in 2010 and just said right that's it I'm starting to eat meat again um people say you know what did you first eat um steak was the first mm-hmm. meal you went big uh, yeah <laughs> just uh, don't I mean, some people ponce around with chicken yeah. or a bit of fish or something a lot of people will say oh I'm vegetarian oh I eat fish yeah. oh I eat chicken well you're not a vegetarian then <laughs> you just don't eat red meat right <laughs> you know when you are a vegetarian you get really annoyed with people who claim to be vegetarian and they don't actually get the terminology right or the vegetarian and they still have gelatin in sweets or something it's like you're not a vegetarian Mm -hmm. honestly it just drives you nuts so that was the end of my period of being vegetarian now I would love to be vegetarian I would absolutely I'd love to be vegan my Mm -hmm. natural instinct would be to be vegan Mm -hmm. so if all day long I could eat fruit and grains and bread I know vegan gets a bit more difficult because you've even got butter and croissants sure. and that kind of thing but you'd, you'd find whole grain bread you can mm-hmm. have brown rice you can have pasta you can have tomato sauces and all that kind of thing if I could eat in that way and then there are junk foods that, I mean mm-hmm. look around the supermarket you've got so much junk now vegan cakes vegan oh, biscuits yeah. vegan ice cream vegan this vegan that I, I would eat in that way because I much prefer carbs mm-hmm. I think 
a lot of people are addicted to carbs. Mm-hmm. I was certainly a carb addict. Give me a choice. If somebody said it has no impact on your weight or your health, how you feel, your energy levels, has no impact on anything. Mm-hmm. It's all a calorie really is a calorie. Nothing has an impact. Yeah. I would eat crap all day long. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think but, we all would. It tastes good, right? Um, yeah, some people say they love I, I think my husband would genuinely eat if he had a choice I think he's eating his perfect diet which mm-hmm. is meat and cheese mm-hmm. vegetables nuts dairy bit of yogurt here and there a few berries yeah. um, but if you said to him you've now got to eat meat and cheese and red wine and nothing else for the rest of your life he'd say hey what's the problem that sounds great yeah <laughs> but I wouldn't like that yeah <laughs> did you notice any change in the way you felt once you started changing your diet almost immediate really almost immediate and what was really interesting again is is the feedback I got from Andy because your partner Mm -hmm. spots things that you don't spot so the single most rapid difference was in my monthly cycle Mm. and he noticed that he could hardly even tell Mm -hmm. when I was coming up to a period whereas almost before it was like oh god (laughs) this is this is going to be the week from hell coming up we haven't had we haven't had one of those for three weeks have we so this one is is coming soon Um, and you just start realizing that your mood is different. Mm-hmm. You feel much more positive, much more even energy, far less hungry. Um, my mood really did lift mm-hmm. and my monthly cycle really did get better. So in the week leading mm-hmm. up to it and then also in things like period pains mm-hmm. and just how blur that you felt yeah. actually coming on. Um, so that that was really immediate. And mm-hmm. then over the next winter you suddenly realize hey I didn't get a cold I didn't get flu I just Mm. don't I mean I got a killer nightmare there was something going around at Denver this year that floored a few people Mm. but I I think that was the first time I'd felt rough in 10 years or something yeah you just you don't get sick anymore that's just giving your body what it needs Mm -hmm. you mentioned something else I want to go back to about how you feel like this is the only way to eat that's the best for the planet and that I think for a a lot of people hearing it will probably be counterintuitive yeah. because so many people now think that um, being vegan or being vegetarian is the healthy way to eat yeah. for our planet. So can you just take us through that sort of argument? Yeah. Okay. Um, again, it's really simple. So the only thing that we have that can basically feed the planet naturally is soil. Mm-hmm. And if you listen to organizations like the Soil Association or the Pasture Fed Livestock Association, the Sustainable Food Trust, soil is everything. Soil is our most precious resource. And soil would typically have been as deep as this room. Mm-hmm. And you've got soil in many, many parts of the world now that is just millimeters thick. Mm-hmm. Or you've got desert land where you just don't have grazing animals at all. Alan Savory has talked about this as well, saying he thought you had to get the animals off the land to save the land. He realized that the animals being on the land was what saved the land. So ruminants play an absolutely unique role in soil protection. So in Wales, where I live, I can look out of the window and I see cows and sheep grazing within a stone's throw different distance. Mm-hmm. And they have a unique four stomach system. Let's talk about the cows. So they've got these four stomachs and they're constantly chewing because they're eating carbohydrates all day long. It's, a, it's another example of, of how you just need to eat carbs yeah. all day long if that's your <laughs> if that's your fuel so they're then digesting the cellulose and the grass that we can't digest mm-hmm. but they're eating billions of microflora which they then host in their gut and then they regurgitate them and then they host them and then at the same time they're weeing and pooing on the land so they're just it's just this cycle of giving back to the soil the whole time mm-hmm. that they're grazing on it and the perfect a crop rotation system would be what we did in the agricultural revolution and that would be that they called it the three field system so you have the animals in the field one year then you move them on the next year and you might have crops in that field mm-hmm. the second year and then you leave the field fallow so you okay. just leave it to rest and then you start the rotation again so farmers would have multiples of three fields and they mm-hmm. just keep moving around that rotation And it was the most perfect way to protect topsoil. Mm. So what do we do at the moment? We are insane. So, And this is where the vegans and the carnivores should have a heated agreement and should be working together to make sure this stops happening. So we take the animals off the land Mm -hmm. and we stick them in sheds with concrete floors. We then plant crops in the fields outside to give to the animals who are having the hellish life in these sheds to put them in trays so that they can Mm -hmm. eat this grain that they can no more digest than humans can they are not built to digest grains or soybeans or wheat or whatever crap we feed Mm -hmm. them 
and then the soil is being raped by the fact that we just put in repeated crops in this situation. So the soil is just getting thinner and thinner and thinner, and the animals that can actually get the topsoil back to health mm -hmm. are kept in sheds. So we need to agree you should never keep an animal in a shed. Mm -hmm. And I know they want to fatten it and finish it off and all the rest of it. All of that has got to stop mm -hmm. because that is not good for the animal. It's not good for the human being. It's not good for the planet. We need those animals out grazing the land. And so we're chopping down Amazon rainforests to grow soybeans. Now, I agree with the vegans that growing the soybeans to feed to the cattle is heinous and wrong and needs to stop. But we're also chopping down Amazon rainforests to feed the demand for alternatives to the animals that we're keeping in the shelves. Mm -hmm. So the sheds, so the people eating the soybeans and the vegan-based products. I mean, the main vegan protein is tofu, mm -hmm. soybeans, which is what we're chopping down forests mm -hmm. to, to grow at such a rate. So there's an area where we can have an agreement and then there's an area where we can have a disagreement, which is actually vegans, it's no more healthy for you to be eating those soybeans than it is for us to be feeding them to the cattle. Mm -hmm. That, unfortunately, those animals are the things that will provide us with the things that we need to be optimally healthy but a vegan world I mean if we all went vegan overnight which is what a lot of people would want us to be I'm sure the Eat Lancet report was headed off in that direction if we went vegan and there's there's no ruminants farmers don't keep animals as pets so there's mm -hmm. no cows there's no sheep there's no goats you don't have any of those animals everyone's on a plant-based diet um, we've probably only got about seven to ten more harvests in some part of the world before we have no topsoil in particular areas anyway so you just accelerate that process so then we have no ability to feed the world naturally now I quite like a good conspiracy theory mm -hmm. I quite like a good James Bond <laughs> plot I can see this as an absolute reality for a James Bond plot because I actually think it's happening right now and we don't realise what's happening because you've got the agri-chemical companies, you've got the sort of Cargills and the Bayers and whatever of this world who are already growing food without soil. So you've got greenhouses across the world where they're growing food upside down, no soil mm -hmm. needed. We don't know what chemicals they're putting on there, what kind of process mm -hmm. they're doing to accelerate the food round. So you can have strawberries in the UK at Christmas, which is not right. a natural food. And they then control the food supply. No mm -hmm. soil, no ability for farmers to grow food naturally you've got the control of the food supply now i think that'd be a great james bond plot sounds they, like a good movie <laughs> they did it with water i can't remember i think it was quantum yeah. of solace or something they did it with someone trying to control the water supply uh -huh. which would be another way of of controlling all human beings yeah. if, if you can cut off their water supply um but i really do think there's something going on mm -hmm. and then you look at the kind of companies that are behind the eat lancet report this this organization of fresh or whatever and there's 40 or so companies, and again, it's the who's who of the fake food industry, the agri-chemical, agri-agriculture, whatever mm -hmm. they're doing, the people who want to control our food supply without soil. And they're the ones telling us to go vegan. So the vegans are basically doing their bidding war. Mm -hmm. They must just look at the vegans on Twitter and say, hey, we just love you guys. You're just like <laughs> merchandisers for our organization. We don't even have to pay you. You're just out there radically getting angry with everyone else on our behalf mm -hmm. and accelerating the time when only we can feed the world and I just I want to bang my head against the wall when I see the vegans doing it and just say how can you be so naive please grow up wake up see what's going on around you mm -hmm. so it sounds like in order for us to kind of vote with our fork if you would say we should be focusing certainly on eating grass-fed meat and supporting sort of a more regenerative agriculture sort of model um obviously if we can all agree we should get all the cows out of the concrete houses and things like that that that's what i think we need to do and yes it's difficult mm -hmm. but we need to do it because mm -hmm. we need to protect topsoil and we need to treat animals with dignity uh, it, mm -hmm. it's just not the right thing to do we, we should be a better species right. than that so we need to do the right thing vis-a-vis -vis animals and mm -hmm. human health and protecting soil for the future generations so that our children's children can mm -hmm. grow their own food. At the moment, our children are going to struggle to grow their own food, let alone our grandchildren. Sure. And just appreciating where our food comes from in general, everything that we eat. I think for me, um, reading Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, I think was very, it was beautifully written to show this whole circle of life and this you know, knowing where your food comes from and how plants and animals all play a role in this ecosystem. And I think it's easy to become very idealistic when you're just buying your food from a supermarket and you're not really, like you said, waking up to what's really going on. Yeah. I ideally, don't buy your food from a supermarket. Buy, mm -hmm. a, buy your food from 
the farm yeah. or from the butcher. Yeah. Um, so we're very lucky in Wales. In, in the UK, there's absolutely no excuse for not eating outdoor animal produce because that's we've got great green areas but then america is big enough to have all of these as well the, the animals that were on the prairies that are now no longer on the prairies because we're growing soybeans or crops or rapeseed oil at just crazy crazy rates so we need to vote with our thought vote with our purse vote with our money vote with our ethics and do the right thing and know where your meat is coming from know where your fish is coming from mm-hmm. that it's sustainable and um, a, a lot of people won't eat meat, but they will go back to eating fish, particularly if they've been vegan. You've even got some vegan, mm. well-known bloggers who've then been attacked by their following because they felt so bad. They've recognized that they have to go back to eating some animal produce. And what they more often go back to is eggs and fish mm-hmm. rather than meat and dairy, because they still have this idea that meat and dairy mm-hmm. is unhealthy or bad for them in some way. And meat is far more sustainable than fish. We've been raping the oceans for far too long. We don't know how much fish we've got left. Uh, the more we take out, the less other fish have got to... It's a food chain in mm-hmm. the in the oceans as well. So you've got the little ones eating the plankton and then the big ones eating the little ones. And some of them are herbivores and some of them are carnivores. And then you've got whales sort of hoovering up anything that's that's in their pathway. So we're disrupting that whole oceanic food chain as well. The most sustainable food that we can manage, we can regrow, is actually the ruminants. We can have the animals give birth to more animals, manage them in a healthy, sustainable, uh, ethical way. Mm -hmm. And then we've just got a nice, healthy cycle of food going on without, it's not as if in the UK you've got lions now trying to kill a cow or kill a sheep. (laughs) Um, We protect sheep from foxes. There's always food chains going on in every walk of life. But the ruminant one, I think, is is the one that's most sustainable for humans, the planets. But we need to do it in a nice way for the animal as well. Definitely. I want to go back and talk a little bit about carbohydrates and the addictive nature of carbohydrates, which you referred to. You said many you would maybe prefer, if you could, if it didn't have any health impact, to just eat carbohydrates. Um, And I think probably most people listening to this can appreciate, at least on some level, um, feeling addicted to carbohydrates or sugar at some point in their, in their life. Um, but it's not something I think that's given enough, um, sort of attention Mm -hmm. or people aren't given enough support to recognize, Hey, this is an addiction and here's how we can solve this problem. But I heard you last night describe kind of the category or the criteria for an addictive Mm. substance and how carbohydrates would fit that. Would you mind just sharing that with us? Yeah, sure. So I shared this in my Why Do You Overeat book Mm -hmm. because to me there's a very simple model because people will will deny that you can be addicted to carbohydrates, which completely baffles me. You can put people in MRI scanners and just show them a picture of an ice cream Mm -hmm. or a cake and their brain wires up as if they were just given a shot of cocaine or heroin Mm -hmm. or something. It's incredible. So first of all, you want a very, very particular thing. Mm -hmm. And anyone who has got an addiction to a particular substance will recognize that straight away. So you want a muffin Mm -hmm. when you're on the way into work in the morning. You then get to the point that you actually want more and more of that particular thing. So you then find yourself picking up a muffin for lunch or maybe a muffin in the late afternoon. Mm -hmm. Or it comes to dinner time and you're thinking, do you know what? I'd actually just rather have a muffin than a salad and whatever else is going on. So that's the stage two of addiction. Mm -hmm. Then you get to the point that you feel bad if you don't have the muffin. So you wake up one morning and you think, oh, I'm just eating muffins too much. This can't be good for me. I'm not going to pick one up on the way to work in the morning. By the time you get to work, you're cranky because you've missed your fix. You have actually become addicted to that particular thing. Mm -hmm. And then stage four of addiction, which is the only stage that gets us to address the addiction, is you start to experience the consequences. So the most typical consequence of food addiction is is being overweight. Mm -hmm. It can be type 2 diabetes. It can be heart disease. It can be cancer if you're having a a huge um, amount of junk and the wrong Mm -hmm. things. But for most people, it's feeling overweight. So you've got the person that suddenly was having two or three muffins a day and muffins are so similar to biscuits and cakes mm-hmm. and other things. So other things start coming in because actually what you're craving is the wheat and the sugar. Mm-hmm. That That's the two substances that you've then become intolerant to. And only, unfortunately, at stage four do people seek help because they realize they've got a weight problem or they realize that they've got an energy problem or they're not sleeping well at night or they're just hungry the whole time and don't know what's going on. And that's when they start searching on the internet or trying to read a diet book or going to a nutritionist or trying to get some help of some kind. But you've had all the three stages that you've been through up until that point and it's very, very difficult then Mm -hmm. 
to to pull out of it so the first book that I wrote as I said was why do you overeat when all you want is to be slim didn't call it the Harkham diet or anything it's just a few years later the Mm -hmm. publisher came to me and said oh people are emailing in and saying about Zoe's diet or the Harkham diet whatever so that's how it came about it always seems a bit um bit sort of odd where the name came from but that that's where it came from but the, the phase one of the diet that I recommend is basically going back to meat fish eggs vegetables salads natural live yogurt and then a tiny bit of a safe grain Mm -hmm. or what I thought at the time to be a safe grain which was probably because I was vegetarian at the time so I was looking at well I need to be doing this and I'm not going to be eating meat and fish Mm -hmm. so I'm okay with eggs and vegetables and salads and so on but that's really not going to fill me up so I'm going to need a bit of brown rice or Mm -hmm. some porridge oats and I do think those grains are are better for us than wheat but it it took everyone off wheat and sugar in in the first early phases Mm -hmm. And it was only five days long because when I'd been doing the research for that book, I'd come across some physical conditions that were causing food cravings. And they're widely talked about now. So you've got things like yeast syndrome, candida, gut flora. Mm-hmm. When the gut flora is out of balance, it can drive cravings for the wrong things. Mm-hmm. That was one of them. Food intolerance, again, widely recognized now and written about that you you become intolerant to the food that you're having too much of too often, which is the food to which you're addicted. So mm-hmm. those just go hand in hand. And then, of course, hyperglycemia, low blood glucose. So you have something sugary, your body tries to take the glucose out of the bloodstream. It doesn't often get it just perfect. We've got four grams of sugar in our entire bloodstream at any one time. One gram too low and suddenly you're below your blood sugar levels and then you want to be getting back up to normal levels. So then you're hungry at that point when your blood glucose levels are low. So again, things that are commonly talked and written about now, but I'd actually worked them out back in the early 90s and then they went into wide ovary in 2004 so the that basic diet was when i'd read so many books separately on hyperglycemia low blood glucose food intolerance candida yeast mm-hmm. syndrome gut flora the diet i just had all these books out around me and i just said right what is the diet that they would all recommend and then it's just the maths that comes in again because it's mm-hmm. what's the lowest common denominator mm-hmm. what are the foods that actually all of them would accept meat fish eggs salad absolutely no question vegetables that they're the safe ones little bit of debate over dairy but the general view is don't allow any dairy but do alive some uh, natural live yogurt because the natural cultures are actually going to be very helpful to try to overcome the the gut flora Mm -hmm. imbalance it's like that one goes back in and then a number of them would say you could have a little bit of something like brown rice or porridge oats and again because i thought that would be helpful particularly for vegetarians that 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 then was phase one and it's only five days long because of the food intolerance driver because anything will go through us in about four days so by the time you get to day five you've actually no longer got the wheat and the sugar in from the muffin that you were addicted to five days ago and people do report going through hell oh yeah and any Karen Thompson's work and any Mm -hmm. sugar counsellor who tries to help people off the foods to which they're addicted don't them to explain oh, yeah. first three days you're going to feel like hell you're going to feel like a drug addict you may even get shakes you will get headaches you will feel irritable you will feel deprived you'll just feel miserable like mm-hmm. I just want a muffin how bad can it be for me but you just got to go through with it because when you get to somewhere around day five suddenly you get the reward because it's like I'm not craving anymore I don't have these energy highs and lows anymore I don't feel bad anymore I don't I don't feel irritable anymore. People talk about a fog lifting. It's like a veil has been taken off their face and suddenly they can see the world clearly Mm -hmm. and they don't feel like they're sleepwalking the whole time. It is so worth it. And then I get emails still. We've got got a club so people can give me direct feedback on how they're getting on with the diet. And and the most common thing that people will say is I started this because I wanted to lose weight. I'm sticking with it because I feel great. And it's, it's just nowhere near as strict as keto or mm-hmm. LCHF or Bantin or anything like that. But I think it's also a good route into that world for people who actually probably do need to go further on carbohydrate restriction. Because by the time they've come across what I do or just this whole idea that they might want to eat real food and cut carbohydrates, mm-hmm. they're so metabolically compromised that they are type 2 diabetic or on the verge of it or they are very obese and it's going to be very difficult to get them back to normal weight without even greater carbohydrate restriction than I would recommend so if if guys are coming in and they're having some brown rice and we can have 
veggie chili with brown rice or butternut squash curry with brown rice or a baked potato we can have some of those things Mm -hmm. but then they quite quickly realize that the the less of the carb meals as we call them the Mm -hmm. carb protein meals the less of those that they have and the more of the fat protein meals the better they feel the more that their glucose is under control so it's a great route into this world because it doesn't shock you can't take a vegetarian and turn Mm -hmm. them keto overnight it just it's rare when that happens Mm -hmm. but you can get a vegetarian and get them off the processed food and get them into real food and then get them down the line of having fewer carb meals and more fat meals and then suddenly they might be doing the keto that they do need to do to be where they want to be Mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely withdrawals are definitely real (laughs) yeah we've all been through them yes we've all been through them and then you get reminders right if you ever if you go have a, a little bit of a carb heavy meal and you get a reminder of how maybe, um, you know, you don't feel well the next day or you wake up. It's sometimes my husband and I joke about how sometimes if you have, you know, some bread or some kind of carb the night before, it's a worse hangover than if you've had a bunch of alcohol. (laughs) But you know, that's really interesting because I think the sensitivity goes. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got a lot of people living in the world at the moment who are just low level feeling rubbish all the time. They, they don't even know how bad they, they feel know, yeah. because they've come to live with it. It's, it's like the alcoholic, the, mm-hmm. the functioning alcoholic. Right. So then you come off the substance and then you go back to it and you are you have been desensitized in the period that you came off it. So it absolutely smacks you in the face mm-hmm. and it reminds you of, of, wow, I was actually feeling quite rubbish quite all the time. And it took coming off all of that stuff to really realize what feeling good feels like. Mm -hmm. And then you go back to it and then your body tells you that's how bad it makes you feel. But there are millions of people around the world just living with that general feeling rubbish all the time who have no idea how good they could feel. Just give it five days. Just come off crap for five days. Mm -hmm. Five days of real food. Really manage your carb intake. Major on meat, fish, eggs, vegetables and just see how you feel. It's life changing this stuff. You can do anything for five days. And then exactly. if you if you really don't feel better, then go back to the way you're eating. And yeah. it's just five days. Yeah. Right. It's a great experiment, mm-hmm. I think. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about vegetables and fiber. Because you talked about how, you know, just above all, we can all agree on eating real food. And that's incredibly important for a healthy diet. And, you know, vegetables are real food. They come from the ground. But I know you talk about how the evidence for like five a day or the evidence for fiber isn't necessarily as strong as we would like to think. Um, So can you talk a little bit about that and then what role you think vegetables do play in the diet? So you start from the nutrition basics, which Mm -hmm. is we need their essential fats, their essential proteins, there are no essential carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So you just start from a factual position of we do not need carbohydrate. There is nothing that we can only get from carbohydrate that we can't get from elsewhere. Then you look at what I did at the presentation in Denver was carbohydrate 101s. So you've got your simple sugars, you've got your disaccharides, you've got your polysaccharides, of which fiber is the indigestible form of polysaccharides. Mm -hmm. So fiber is a subset of carbohydrate. So if carbohydrate is not essential, then fiber is not essential. So you just start from that as a base point. Let's just establish we do not need it. So then the next question you ask is, but is it good for you? Because I use the example of laughter. Laughter is not essential, but it sure as hell is good for you. Mm -hmm. But you then go looking for the evidence that fiber is good for us, and it's just not there. Mm. Um, And I went through this. Again, if you Googled um, me and my name and fiber, Mm -hmm. the the presentation should come up. It's on OpenView. Mm -hmm. But you look at, um, first of all, you go for, are there any meta-analyses of RCTs? No, they're not. Because there's basically only one RCT that was long enough and large enough that could actually go to saying, is fiber good for us? And that's the diet and reinfarction trial published back in 1989. We've Mm -hmm. done nothing that long or that large since. 2,033 men from near where I live, actually, in Wales, in the Caerphilly area. And they did a number of different interventions, but one of them was a fiber intervention. And there are actually more deaths in the fiber intervention from both Mm -hmm. any cause or from heart disease cause. Weren't statistically significant, but the numbers actually look quite significant because they were different by, I think it was at least 10 from memory. Um, So they were what we would call significant, but not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. And that was the one 
RCT. Then I looked at Cochrane evidence and the Cochrane position when they've looked at fibre or they've looked at whole grains as a representation of fibre and they've looked at things like heart disease, they've looked at diabetes and they basically come to the conclusion we need bigger, longer RCTs. Mm -hmm. um, so of course it'd be great to think people would rush out and do bigger, longer <laughs> RCTs, but no they don't. <laughs> they just turn to epidemiology. So then they say, oh we've got this person here who eats lots of fibre and they don't get as much diabetes or they don't get as much heart disease or they live longer. Therefore, if you ate fibre, you would live longer. And it just is it's the entire problem with epidemiology. The epidemiology is basically describing a person. Mm -hmm. So we have what we call the healthy person confounder, but basically epidemiology is about that healthy person. So you look at the characteristics table and they'll say, oh, the people who are eating under five grams of fiber a day which really takes some doing i mean you've, you've really got to have a bad diet to be having it's tough <laughs> or you're a carnivore mm -hmm. you deliberately don't eat plants but these studies date back to the 1960s and 70s they were not studying carnivores then mm -hmm. so think of the kind of person who in the 1960s 70s 80s was eating under five grams of fiber they must have had a dreadful diet then you look at the person who was eating a lot of fiber and again who in the 1980s was eating legumes and whole grains. Mm -hmm. It was really forward thinking people, really affluent people, leading edge, early adopters, whatever. You look at the characteristics table at those extremes, this person is at least twice as likely to smoke, mm -hmm. two or three times more likely to be over consuming alcohol, infinitely less likely to be taking any kind of exercise, therefore much more likely to be sedentary, lower income, far less educated. You can picture, and I do in my presentations, I actually put up a picture of the kind of couple that you might see in the food hall at the supermarket mall, because they hang around the supermarket mm -hmm. mall at the weekend, and they're in the food hall, and they are morbidly obese, and they might have a stroller with them because they actually can't get around the mall on their own in even their 50s or something mm -hmm. and this is just life's not advantaged people they just didn't get dealt the good cards mm -hmm. in life and then you've got the people at the other extreme who are probably sailing in the Hamptons at the weekend and the children are in private school and they're already working out how they can get them into Harvard and Yale and all the rest of it at, at the extremes, which is what they measure in epidemiology, that is as extreme as it gets. Mm -hmm. And Gary Tobes puts this really nicely because he's saying, okay, so then they take those extremes and what they're saying is if only these people ate like these people did, mm -hmm. they'd be as healthy as they are. <laughs> And how can you even start <laughs> to think that that is a sensible conclusion to come to? Right. And I often say when people say, oh, seven a day, wouldn't that be marvellous? Okay, so come to near where I live in the valleys in Wales, where you've got the smoking drinkers, fourth generation unemployed. There mm. are people who haven't had a job, their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents, they never had a job. And what do they do? They hang around the bingo hall all day, or maybe they just watch reality TV all day, sat on the couch, eating rubbish, smoking, go to bed at night, wake up and do the whole thing again the next morning. And you're really trying to tell me that all I have to do with that group of people is give them some fruit and fibre for breakfast and an apple for lunch and their lives are going to be transformed into this all singing, all dancing, affluent couple from Chelsea or the Hamptons or whatever. It's like... There's so many more factors. Don't even... Don't even treat people as that stupid. How can you... The Harvard team... Harvard is supposed to be a euphemism for intelligence and esteemed good practice or whatever. How are you so stupid that you can be pumping this out on an almost weekly basis and conning the average person that you're actually coming up with something that is important or that we should take note of? It's just absolutely disgusting. And then they put the headlines in the paper. So then they just scare the life out of these poor people that just un have no access to whole grains and legumes and wouldn't know how to cook them if they did, may not even have a kitchen in their bed sit. Mm -hmm. And then they're telling them they're going to be 23% more likely to get type 2 diabetes if they don't eat legumes and whole grains. Well, it's like, just stop it. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> and there's a huge difference too when it comes to the fiber that's in, like you said, whole grains versus the green vegetables or things like that. Um, and so can you talk us through that, like the rationale why you don't think necessarily grains are as necessary, but you still enjoy eating vegetables? Well, it's just, it, it's, it's again, back to the essential versus mm -hmm. helpful or mm -hmm. beneficial in mm -hmm. some ways. So we know that vegetables aren't essential 
unlike whole grains, I actually think that vegetables can be quite beneficial because they're not bringing much carbohydrate mm-hmm. to the table. Vegetables are mostly water, right. which is why if you have a big bowl of salad, you're going to need a wee in about an hour's <laughs> time because you've just drunk a glass of water. Um, but particularly raw vegetables, the kind of super salad mm-hmm. that people would be talking about, you, you do get some good nutrients in that. They do mm-hmm. bring along, okay, it's carotene for vitamin A rather than, than retinol. You've got some B vitamins in there. You've got the vitamin C. Mm-hmm. Because those foods come from the ground, they tend to be richer in minerals. So mm-hmm. then you will get, particularly in the green vegetables, if you can have some rocket salad, for example, the dark green, some good iron mm-hmm. there that, that's coming along to the party. So they bring stuff to the party. Um, but they're also, they're nice. I kind of think if you look at the plate, you, you've got no room for starch on the plate mm-hmm. because half of your plate should be pr- meat or fish mm-hmm. or, veg- uh, or eggs or dairy, the fat proteins that are actually going to give you the nu- nutrients. And then maybe the other half of the plate should be the vegetables, ideally the super salad. You've got no room for the starchy things like rice, pasta, Mm -hmm. potatoes, because they're actually then bringing nothing to the party that you haven't already got on your plate. All they're bringing is carbohydrates and calories, which fine if you're underweight, have potatoes with your steak. Mm -hmm. That'll be a good way of of getting your weight back up to a normal level. But we are not dealing with underweight in the developed world anymore. We are massively dealing with overweight and obesity. And anyone who's overweight or obese who's putting starchy carbohydrates on their plate and we're told by our public health authorities, base your meals on starchy foods, Mm -hmm. the very things that we used to know made us fat. So that's got to stop. That's not healthy. You're known for being excellent at dissecting research studies. And I know that I've heard that other... Um, very prominent scientists and researchers look to you to to help them sometimes with dissecting research studies or to get your opinion. Can you take us through your process? When you get a new study on your desk, what are you looking at? What How are you going through it? Do you know, it's funny, at dinner last night when we were talking with Greg, yeah. founder of CrossFit, what an honor. Um, and he was sort of saying, he, he, he looks at... Um, conflict porn or whatever or or (laughs) science porn the the, the terrors that are going on in our scientific world and the outrage that is is taking place and he gets off on on reading that kind of (laughs) stuff well to keep his analogy going I get off on looking at a study I love nothing more than just seeing a paper and then within a few minutes of reading it realizing where where they've gone wrong Mm -hmm. almost immediately um it comes back to being a mathematical nerd. It comes back to just being, I've always been good at spotting patterns. I'm not good at languages. I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And I'm good at spotting patterns. So when you have those number sequences and it's sort of what's mm-hmm. the next number, I love those kind of things. So the first thing I'll look at is the numbers. I don't actually read the paper. So I go to the tables and I go to the figures and I then work out where they've got the conclusion from. So you've got the abstract, Let, let's say the one I did last week. So there is a claim that plant-based diets would be better for type 2 diabetes. So you start off from the point of that makes no sense. Plants deliver glucose, mm-hmm. all plants deliver glucose. Type 2 diabetes could possibly be simply summarized as the inability to handle glucose. So how does putting glucose into someone who can't handle glucose, how would that make it better? How would, because it was about prevention of type 2 diabetes, how would putting glucose in prevent you from getting a glucose-related condition, can't handle glucose Mm -hmm. condition? It just makes no sense. So you're going in with the mindset of this makes no sense. How can we make some sense out of it? So then you go to the numbers. Now, it's quite difficult when you're looking at meta-analyses because meta-analyses pull together the original studies. Mm -hmm. So you've lost a lot of the detail. So you go to the meta-analysis and you'd say, how many studies was this based on? Nine studies. So then you go to what they call the forest plot where they've pulled everything Mm -hmm. together. And then you say, are there particular studies that have basically accounted for most of the weight and and this one was really helpful because sometimes they can take days I do one of these every Monday Mm -hmm. and some days you're barely even finishing one before it's due to be published Mm -hmm. Um, so on this one there was one particular paper that had analyzed three of the studies and it's the classic studies that always get analyzed by the Harvard boys it's the nurses Mm -hmm. health study there's the nurses health study follow-up and then there's the health professionals follow-up study which is the men and those three studies out of the nine accounted for more than 50 percent of the weight in the meta-analysis really lucky breakthrough you go to the references at the back and one of those papers has actually presented all the data for those three studies Mm -hmm. so they use the same reference Mm -hmm. for those three studies
studies. So you go back to that paper and that's where you've got the details. So that's where you've got the characteristics table. So that's where you've got the confirmation that these people drank, uh, the, the people who had the bad diet, high animal, low plant, were the smokers, the drinkers, the low income, mm-hmm. the poorly educated, more likely to have a family history of diabetes, all these kind of things. Then you start seeing what they adjusted for. Then you go back up to the meta-analysis paper and realise that a number of the papers, four of the nine, I think it was off the top of my head, did not adjust for alcohol intake. Two of them did not even adjust for smoking. I can't remember how many didn't adjust for family history of diabetes. So you haven't even adjusted for the things that are going to impact this study monumentally. So you know there's an issue straight away. But then back to those three studies. So they've got at one extreme what they call this really low plant, high animal, bad diet. And then at the other extreme, practically vegan, high plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. So down in the bad diet, the average calorie intake was 1,600 calories for men, 1,400 calories for women. And up in the good diet, it was something like 2,200 calories for women, 2,600 for men. Mm. So these guys <laughs> have forgotten a third of what they ate. Yeah. What if they forgot all the vegetables <laughs> and the quinoa and the nuts and all the rest of it? What if they're just like, oh, I can't be bothered. It's a food frequency question. Most food frequency questionnaires say, what did you eat last year? Oh, my gosh. I mean, mostly I just sit looking at them. Did you have one egg a day or did you have six to seven a week? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like that. How do, how do you answer that one? And at the extremes, it breaks down. Mm-hmm. Then you spot other crazy things. So you go into the footnotes in the tables and you realize that ice cream and sherbet are in dairy, mm-hmm. which is in your animal groups. Mm-hmm. And then they have this miscellaneous animal foods category, which incredulously included pizza. Because pizza might have an animal thing on right. it. That's plant food to me. <laughs> And it had mayonnaise, and I can't remember what else was in there. But it's like, guys, what are you doing? This is just not robust. Mm -hmm. And then you go back and read the paper. So when you've realized all the things that you've spotted that are wrong, you then go back and read what the researchers were trying to claim. And of course, everything then jars because you know they haven't said this and they haven't said that and they haven't been honest about this. And then on this one, you get to the end of their discussion and they say, okay, so we looked at not just all the plants, but healthy plants versus unhealthy plants. Mm -hmm. So then they split it out into whole grains, legumes, vegetables and fruits versus, because let's face it, plant food also includes sugar and wheat and refined carbohydrates Mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So they said, oh, and, and when the three studies did that and they looked at all plants, they actually had an increased risk of diabetes. Mm. But when they looked at the healthy plants, then they had an inverse risk of diabetes. So we're back to the healthy person confounder. We're back to healthy people don't end up getting diabetes because they tend to be slim and active and affluent and it's just not acceptable to be overweight if you're in that kind of social circle Mm -hmm. versus the people who just are less disadvantaged for whom, hey, you're overweight, type 2 diabetic, who cares? So is everyone I know in my peer group. And that's what it then comes down to. So it's got nothing to do with plant foods being good for diabetes because it can't be to do with that because that makes no sense. And yet because their whole mindset coming out of Harvard is we need to be eating a plant food diet, that's all they want to Mm -hmm. propose. How would you advise people listening or just lay public who are reading the headlines about nutrition? You know, obviously it's different than dissecting a research study, but what are the red flags that you look for or how do you know if what you're reading is completely off versus if it's something that maybe has some validity? I, I'd probably say any story that you read in the paper, just ignore. <laughs> just just completely ignore. Yes. Because you'll get one every every week, which mm-hmm. is why I've still got a topic to cover every week, mm-hmm. 10 years on. I've never, ever had a week where I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to write on Monday? Yeah. It's, it's more likely, do I do the plant-based and type 2 diabetes or do I do the cancer and processed food? Or There are so many coming out each week. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say totally ignore them all, particularly ignore any that try to put a percent on things. Mm-hmm. So... 23% less chance of getting type 2 diabetes or 12% less chance of getting cancer if you don't have fruit juice every day or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, all of those can be ignored because they scream the headline of what we call the relative risk. They never explain to you the absolute risk. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I do when I look at the epidemiological papers is go into the absolute risk. So in this plant-based um, study that I've just looked at, When you looked at the overall follow-up years and you looked at the number of incidences over the follow-up years, the actual incident rate was 0.38%. 
which is not even four in a thousand. Mm. So you then apply 23% to that. And it's the difference, I think off the top of my head, between 0.34 and 0.41. So it's the difference between 3.4 in a thousand and 4.1 in a thousand. Now, if I said to somebody, even if you have that, even if it is causal and it isn't, because you cannot establish causation from epidemiology, but even if eating eating that absolutely horrific diet with the pizza, the sherbet, the ice cream, not a single vegetable, absolute, complete and utter rubbish, but that's actually what you want to eat, Mm -hmm. and then it might make less than a one in a thousand difference between eating that and eating legumes and beans and pulses and nuts and seeds and all these other things that they're going to try and tell you are good for you. Mm For one, not even one in a thousand, do you want to make that change? The person sat in the food mall who's just about to order a KFC or a McDonald's or 12 Dunkin' Donuts or whatever is going to say, hey, no, I'm just going to stick with a stick with a crap diet because that is minute. Mm-hmm. And yet every single epidemiological study, that is the rel- that's the absolute difference that the relative risk boils down to. You know, try to explain to me. Doctors don't understand this. Mm-hmm. And Malcolm Kendrick will run doctors through it. And he'll say, so what do you think that 23% extra risk of getting diabetes is? And they think if there are 100 people in this group that are going to get diabetes, then there are 123 people in that group who are going to get diabetes. Mm-hmm. And then he'll say, no, try 3.4 in 1,000 in that group and 4.1 in 1,000 in that group. And they're like, how does that work? because they don't get the difference between absolute and relative Relative risk. risk. Everything comes down to what it's divided by. So you could have a one in a million chance of developing a particular seriously rare cancer. And then you might have, if somebody says you've got a 12% greater chance of developing that cancer, then it would be 1.12 over a million Mm -hmm. for your increased risk of getting that cancer. So one in a million, 1.12 in a million for a 12% difference. Do you care? One in a thousand versus 1.12 in a thousand. Do you care? No. Mm -hmm. Most people don't even care at one in a hundred. When you tell them that, for example, with a statin, you've got to treat 150 people to avoid one event and yet you've got a one in 50 chance of getting type 2 diabetes. Do you care? Is that worth the odds? I had doctors explain to me that when the NNT came in, the numbers needed to Mm -hmm. treat, their world changed. I was sat near a doctor at a conference recently who said when that first came in, Mm -hmm. he said, I thought every time I was prescribing a blood pressure medication, I was saving a life. Mm -hmm. When I realized that the NNT for my blood pressure meds was 87, I think he said, I've got to treat 87 people to make a difference to one. And that's not a fatality. That's just to make a difference, perhaps avoid some kind of event in one. He said, then my life got changed again. He re- rethought meds. Yeah, it's a very different to think about just the day-to-day and the guidelines that you're following versus what is the actual impact that this is actually going to have on the person's life. Very interesting. So I know you've obviously done a ton of work looking at dietary guidelines. I know that you've also um, contributed a lot to try to improve dietary guidelines. And last year made a submission to the USDA when they were asking for advice about or research about um, fat, the saturated fat guidelines and the low carb guidelines. And um, you did some excellent responses and and pointed them towards some very key research. Um, Why do you think our dietary guidelines are so important? And what, what impact would that have if we could actually change the guidelines to say, kind of what you said earlier about a healthy diet to just say eat real food this is why I support what Nina Teicholz is doing so much because she is trying to work at that Mm -hmm. top level to influence the guidelines Mm -hmm. and it is important because they determine they determine so much they determine what kids are fed in school what patients are fed in hospital Mm -hmm. what people are fed in the military or what they're fed in any part of the public sector in the US what they're fed in prisons and they determine what dietitians are allowed to disseminate mm-hmm. as advice. And of course, you've got this horrific credentialing system in the US and monopolistic practices where only the registered dietitians who are in bed with the fake food companies. I mean, the, 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 this is one of the things that I'm talking about in my CrossFit presentation this week, the way that they have absolutely wrapped up delivering essentially fake food advice through their merchandisers, mm-hmm. dietitians, in other words, is, is just absolutely horrific. So... If the diet guidelines change at the top, they have to give different advice. 
because at the moment they're protected if they're following the guidelines. Mm -hmm. The people who are not protected, as Gary Tobes again said, if I give low fat advice to someone and they get fat and metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, it doesn't matter because I'm covered Mm -hmm. because I was giving out the official advice. If I do the right thing and take somebody who's borderline type 2 diabetes and take them off refined foods and carbohydrates and tell them not to have 55% of their food in the form of carbohydrate and then something happens to them, even though it's less likely that something is going to happen to them, then I'm in trouble. So they determine everything. They determine every bit of advice that is given to people, which is why it is so important that they they do change. Mm -hmm. What can people listening do to help support those efforts support the nutrition coalition Mm -hmm. talk to friends and family go to conferences where these things are are being explained support people in this field so say buying books isn't perhaps the best Mm -hmm. way to support them Uh, but if you can support them some people have got donate buttons on their site if you see somebody who you think is doing good work or whatever Mm -hmm. then maybe support them or even just follow them on twitter and show your support for them but there, there's three ways that we can change this. There's, I mean, if you think of it as a pyramid, there's the top down, mm-hmm. change the guidelines, which which is where Nina's working. And that is mm-hmm. such an important level to so support the Nutrition Coalition, support what she's doing. Then there's the bottom, which is the bottom up revolution, which is all the people who go along to conferences, find something out on the internet, buy a book. Every person has their own story of how mine was going to the Western Price Conference. Mm -hmm. Every person has their own story about how they became enlightened, that everything we've been told about food and nutrition was wrong. That's the bottom up revolution because they they can really influence a number of people Mm -hmm. because they go to their friends and their families and people see that they've lost loads of weight and they look great. They've reversed or put their type 2 diabetes into remission they tell stories and every person that they influence that then has a domino effect but the most interesting level is the health practitioner level which I know is complicated in the US because of this outrageous credential and monopoly situation that you find yourself in but we don't have that in the UK Mm. so yes doctors are they have guidelines they have guidelines that come down from an organization called the National Institute of Care and Health Excellence But some of those can be quite broad and some of them can be quite open to interpretation. So you've got doctors in the UK who have realised that some of those guidelines will say you can treat patients on an individual basis. And for type 2 diabetes, you can look at things like the glycemic index and glycemic load. Mm. So you've got doctors like David Mm -hmm. Unwin or Campbell Murdoch or Ian Lake who will seize upon that and then say, well, the carbohydrates are the ones with the high glycemic index, the high glycemic load. So I'm going to start taking my guys off some of those and help. Ian Lake particularly helps with type 1 diabetes the others particularly help with type 2 diabetes so there is some leeway now that doctor level for me which is up in the middle of the pyramid that is the most interesting one because change a doctor get them along to one of these conferences Mm -hmm. somebody such as yourself for example you can impact a thousand patients Mm -hmm. and then you've got a thousand more n equals ones down at the bottom Mm -hmm. who are influencing the family and the friends and that's how the momentum can go Now, how close are we to the tipping point? I have no idea. Some days I think we're a long way away from it. Mm -hmm. Some days I think we're quite close. The really annoying thing is that the top down is the one that could just blow this thing apart overnight. And yet I think that's the area that is least likely to change, Mm -hmm. which is why we have to keep going at the practitioner level, have to keep going at the N equals one level and have to support people like Nina. How she keeps doing what she's doing, I don't know. Um, but she she has to keep going, trying to change them mm-hmm. because that is annoyingly the level that could just change everything overnight. Absolutely. Um, I want to start wrapping up with three questions that I <laughs> asked. Singing. I, uh, <laughs> I want some water. I want some We're air going for the marathon here. <laughs> so there's three questions I ask everyone at the end of the podcast. Um, the first one is the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health. Okay. Uh, I'm glad you're not going to ask me all three because yeah. that, that one's in three parts already. Yeah. Um, so what do I do that has the most positive impact on my health? I eat well. Mm-hmm. I practice what I preach. Mm-hmm. I, I will have something um, if I fancy it. I'm not ri- rigid. I don't count anything. I'm not mm-hmm. keto. If I fancy an ice cream on a hot day, I will have an ice cream on a hot day, but I'm not having ice cream on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So I practice what I preach. I eat well. Uh, it's It's got to be equal first. I have a great partner my husband Andy Mm -hmm. I couldn't live without I couldn't do without he is my chef he is the reason (laughs) that I eat so well he's my rock he's my sanity he's my everything I would not be the healthy balanced grounded person that I am now without him so him in my life is massively important 
Um, and then anything else would pale into in, in insignificance, I think, behind those two. Because I think mm -hmm. if you've got a, a great loving partner, yeah, I've got family and friends and all the rest of it, but I, I have to single him out. And then I am not sedentary. Mm -hmm. I don't go to the gym. Um, I'm not wearing a sleeveless dress today, but I have <laughs> I have good arms apparently. Um, that's not from coming going to the gym. I do functional fitness, mm -hmm. um, which for me is just the things that need to be done around the house. So I clean the house. I do the gardening. We've got mm -hmm. quite a big garden, so I need to do the gardening. I will lift things. I won't ask for help from someone. I'll just lug something around myself, yeah. even if it practically kills me. <laughs> um, I don't do cycling and running and all that kind of thing. I occasionally go swimming. I like walking. We had a dog, unfortunately, until just Aww. before Christmas. She was just adorable. Um, but we keep up the walking, even though we don't have her. We walk other dogs in okay. the village. So we keep that going. Good. What's one thing that you think would have a big impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it or you haven't haven't quite gotten to it yet? Um, God, that's a good question as well, actually. Because if, if, if I recognize that something, I work too hard. I, I do know that. Um, the one thing that I have to try to do more of, and I am trying to do it at the moment, is saying no, mm -hmm. because I cannot physically keep up with all the requests that come in. Can you do this? Can you write this paper? Can you dissect this? Can you come to this conference? Can you talk here? Mm -hmm. Can you make a contribution here? Paid requests as well, which I turn down because I don't want the conflicts. I want to stay truly independent. Mm -hmm. But also people that you do want to help, but there are just physically not enough hours in the day. There are not enough hours in the day even to answer the emails that I get in. And I do feel bad about that. Um, you want to get back to everyone, but you just can't. Yeah. So the thing I need to do more of to protect me is to say no to others because that's saying yes to me. That's the way I need to look at it, saying yes to my health and my balance mm -hmm. and my sanity and work less get more time off I'm crap at relaxing and not doing something yeah so um, I can identify with you on that one this is <laughs> this is harder. my vacation and I I love it but I'm spending it <laughs> You're doing podcasts doing lots of podcasts which I mean I wouldn't rather do anything else but yeah I call this vacation <laughs> mm -hmm. um so what on that note what made you decide that coming and speaking at the CrossFit Health Conference was something you wanted to say yes to oh I was honored I mean there are there are conference invites that you get I remember when I got the invite to the um South Africa one from Karen mm. And I didn't know what was going on with Prof Notes and I didn't know who else was going to be there. And I'd not been invited before to go to that kind of conference. But there was something that just said, I have to be there. Mm -hmm. I just have to be there. We're paying our own flights or whatever. I just need to be down there. And that turned out to be a great decision. Mm -hmm. Most fabulous catalyst for meeting new and great people. So when Karen called up and said, can you come for this? I go anywhere in the world for Karen. Yes. Um, but what an honor. I mean, CrossFit, I have huge admiration for the organization, for Greg, for what they're standing up for. Only just recently, they were battling Facebook over this banting, mm -hmm. closing down the group or whatever. And I like that we've got someone now in this world who's prepared to stand up to the bullies, prepared mm -hmm. to stand up to the conventional advice, prepared to expose the nonsense and the the real evil that's going on mm -hmm. the real scumbag stuff of, of organizations that should not be in bed together being in bed together and that you've got a champion who's prepared to expose some of that and I'm honored I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to be here and I'm um, really looking forward to it I'm looking forward to the games as well yes. glad I'm not going to be taking part I know <laughs> you've been there I'm in awe of you and, and people who can do that kind of thing I'm, um, I'm I'm really 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 looking forward to the week coming up it's going to be fun. And I am very much looking forward to your talk too. Thank you. Um, last question is just what does a healthy life look like to you? Um, doing doing the right things. And it's it's being like that healthy person mm -hmm. can found a person. So it is eating real good food. It's not smoking. I personally don't like the taste of alcohol. It tastes like vinegar to me. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's a problem with drinking in moderation. I think red wine should be, red or white wine should be part of a a healthy lifestyle mm -hmm. move in um, I'm far more into don't be sedentary than I am into do do crazy mm -hmm. CrossFit games kind of <laughs> sure. stuff I shouldn't say that um, have people around you that love you and that you love mm -hmm. community friendship support is so vital mm -hmm. if you've got people in your life who are draining you just get rid of them you've got to have people in your life who are energizing you just cut all negativity out of your life so if you're getting crap on social media just block them or mute them mm -hmm. just just don't engage them don't feed the trolls just keep your own core and your own values and your own ethics and your own sanity and if other people want to be nasty and spiteful and vindictive mm -hmm. and whatever that's their problem but I got one life I'm not going to live it in that way.
Absolutely. I love it. Life is too short. Well, where can people find more of you and more of your writing and your work? Um, I'm on zoeharcombe.com, H-A-R-C-O-M-B-E. Um, I do this blog every week. Mm-hmm. That's my business model, having mm-hmm. worked out that it's not books. Um, so if anyone wants to sign up, I think it's a pound a week or uh, I don't know. It's, it's not many bucks anyway, mm-hmm. certainly over in the US. And you can then see all the back newsletters from the last 10 years and any classic study I will have analysed, whether it's the um, Notto low carbs are going to kill you, the mortality study or mm-hmm. the crazy one that came out last August, anything on red meat and cancel, red meat and diabetes. There's so much stuff there. And then every week, you get the newsletter that comes out on a Monday where I've dissected last week's a bit of nonsense and um, some really nice people say it's actually the highlight of their week getting the Monday note and I saw that study and that's what was going on and and it saves them having to do the work so and particularly for people like personal trainers Mm -hmm. um, or nutritionists where they will get somebody coming into them oh I saw that plant-based diet thing last week or red meat and cancer and then they've just got the exec summary with five bullets of this was wrong and this was wrong and this was wrong and then the person oh great thank you Mm -hmm. I'm doing the work for you so save yourself the bother give me a pound a week so I can put cat food in the bowl and uh, and we'll all be happier it's amazing well I will definitely be subscribing and hopefully some other people will as well I thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing I think it's incredibly valuable Um, and again I look forward to hearing your talk and continuing to read your work thank you very much thanks for the podcast yes wonderful All right. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I learned a ton from Zoe in this conversation, as well as hearing her speak at the CrossFit Health Conference a few days later. And as usual, I'm wrapping it up with three of my biggest takeaways from the episode. Number one was how Zoe does such a great job of illustrating the problems with our current dietary guidelines and makes a really great case for the need to change. It's really frustrating to think about how much sickness, suffering, and damage has resulted from the dietary guidelines that were made decades ago without having a solid foundation of evidence, as she uncovered in her PhD thesis. So when it comes to the question, what is a healthy way to eat, I'm always skeptical about who is giving the answer and what their underlying motives are, and I always revert back to what Zoe says in this podcast is something pretty much everyone can agree upon, which is eat real food. My second takeaway was about nutrition research in general. Most of the nutrition research that you hear about is flawed in some way. That's because nutrition is just a very difficult field to study, and much of the research relies on epidemiology, which is limited. It's riddled with limitations, and it's difficult to draw definitive conclusions from. So whenever you hear a new headline about nutrition, make sure not to take it at face value. Look at the original article, conflicts of interest in research design, or look to someone you trust like Zoe who knows how to dissect these small details, and that can make a huge difference in how you're interpreting this advice that you may hear on a day-to-day basis. My third takeaway was about our discussion on meat consumption. I really enjoyed what Zoe had to say, and I especially in her discussion about meat consumption and its impact on the environment. I think so often the story that we hear is about how removing meat from your diet can improve the environment or is good for the environment. But Zoe makes some really good points about how our farming practices are also damaging to the environment and how perhaps a return to a more natural cycle of free range animals and crop rotation Living in concert is actually what we need to save our planet and our natural food sources before all we have to rely on is processed foods. So I hope you learned something from this jam-packed conversation. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. To make sure you never miss an episode and to receive exclusive content from me, head to my website, juliefouché.com, and subscribe to my email list. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and consider giving the podcast a five-star rating on iTunes. Also, don't forget to share your stories. If you or someone you know has used lifestyle to overcome a serious health challenge, please send me an email at info at juliefouché.com. I'll choose some of these inspiring stories to share here on future episodes. Don't forget you can train with me through Beyond the Whiteboard by visiting trainwithjuliefouché.com. Thank you again so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time on Pursuing Health. Pursuing Health.